Welcome and hello everyone into Sports Talk Chicago with Joey Christopoulos. You can follow me on socials at Joey Sports Guy. I hope you're having a wonderful Saturday night here on WLS AM 890. Tonight, we welcome legendary Chicago Sun-Times columnist Rick Tallender. He's going to talk about Caleb Williams, Steve McMichaels and Schreiman into the Hall of Fame, the fate and future of the White Sox, and answer the question, is Ryan Sandberg the greatest second baseman of all time. It's an in-depth conversation with a man who has seen it all in Chicago sports. So without further ado, my interview with Rick Tellender. My guest this week right here on Sports Talk Chicago, right here on WLS with Joey Christopoulos, is former senior writer for Sports Illustrated, but you know him better as the legendary columnist for the Chicago Sun-Times over the past 28 years. He is an eight-time Illinois Sports Writer of the Year award winner, has published over 18 books, including the upcoming book, The Magic Ball, co-written by former Cub Steve Trout himself he also may be possibly he is known for being in documentaries from time to time he may have more tv credits than me i think i'm at 12 he can let me know if he's beat me it's rick tallender often imitated never duplicated how are you sir hi joey yeah people ask me because i was in the last dance you know yes. being interviewed boy you must have made a lot of money on that it's like no michael jordan didn't give me any money no uh so you have more credits than i do i hope to god Oh, well, thank goodness. Did they, did they buy you lunch at least, Rick? Did they buy you lunch nothing. that day? I got nothing. You sit, sit in a chair with a microphone and all these people around and say, yeah, that's good. That's good. You can tell when you're saying something that they really like, you know, and try to give it to them so you can get out of there eventually. But no, it was fun. But I got absolutely nothing. Not even... Not even, uh, you know, a pair of Air Jordans or something, no. <laughs> come, come on, Mike. Come on, Mike. You're doing pretty good for yourself, MJ. You could at least figure it out and do Imagine something for Mr. Tallender. And all you have to do is wear a pair of shoes. Just wear them. Or don't even wear them. Just touch them, and you can sell them for thousands of dollars. That's what I would do all day long is just touch shoes and then have people come to my house and sell them for, you know, have somebody out front. Michael Jordan touched this. You know, 5,000, 5,000, 5,000. You have to sell 200 pairs a day. Well, of course, he doesn't need money. That's the other issue. Yeah, <laughs> so, I have. I, uh... guess... <laughs> I don't know. It's nuts, man. Yeah, at my uh, at my dad's house, I probably have a huge bag of baseballs. One of them happens to be signed by Michael Jordan. So that one all of a sudden is a little bit more, uh, a little oh. bit more valuable than the others. That's for sure. Yeah, um, is it from the Barons down at uh, minor leagues or? Yeah, it... yeah, it's a it's a long story, but uh, my my aunt um, dated general manager Ron Schuler for for some time and was able to get me a signed ball at a very young age when I was about ten or eleven years old, and it was my prized possession uh, for for many many years. So uh, wow. I do have something that MJ touched uh, in my possession <laughs> at my dad's kudos. house in in the closet. Yeah, kudos to Aunt Christopoulos. Uh, you know. <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah, she's a beautiful woman, wonderful lady. And honestly, Rick, this is a perfect transition into uh, we're going to hit a couple of topics here on Sports Talk Chicago with Rick Tellender here, because I just w- I value your wealth of knowledge and your perspective on some things. So I want to start first with Caleb Williams. Um, look, uh, we, we talked pre-show. You haven't gotten the opportunity to watch Hard Knocks. Don't worry about it at all. They did have a moment in there where I am paraphrasing just a touch. But the, the narrator, Liev Schreiber, said, Caleb Williams has the opportunity to one day be as big as Michael Jordan. Um, And that almost made me fall out of my chair. So, Rick, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about how we view sports and how we view what we call the chosen one. Um, Caleb Williams appears to be the new chosen one in Chicago sports in 2024. Maybe we could just start with the easy one here. Um, Is it safe to say that Matching and being as big as Michael Jordan may perhaps be an impossible task. Is that a, is that an expectation that's a little far off? Well, we could start with this. I believe LeBron James has the chosen one tattooed on his arm. I'm pretty sure I've stood there right in front of him. He's got that. He still hasn't replaced or become Michael Jordan. And this guy's got 50 trillion points. He's He's still as good as ever. He's 40 years old. I don't think there'll ever be a Michael Jordan because there uh, won't be that kind of moment again where you can come out of what he came out of uh the 90s and then winning the you know the drama the six championships broken up by retiring by his father being murdered by all this drama that went along with it and then uh the the, you can't separate him from the shoe from the logo from the jump man that was when marketing and actually having something that was endorsed by a particular athlete just exploded. I mean, the guy still makes, I think he, uh, you know, I may be off by a few tens of millions, but he makes close to 80 or $100 million a year today 
He hasn't played for 20 years or so just off of his uh, Jordan brand. So if you can do that, uh, uh, Caleb Williams, I mean, okay, listen, he could be a really big deal. He could be a great quarterback. Chicago loves quarterbacks. Uh, in fact, when Michael Jordan became so big, you know, Chicago was not necessarily in love with the Bulls. He changed everything globally about the NBA. He really did. So I remember being in Paris when the Bulls played over there, and it was like, you know, they said it was like the Beatles, and it was similar to that. Uh, you know, Pippen, Rodman, um, Phil Jackson, you know, these guys. Although one of them wasn't there. I think it was um, either Pippen was injured. But anyway, Jordan was there. It was like, my God, this is Paris, 1990, what was it, 95, maybe? Something like that, 96? I think they, I think they did that in 98, right? I, right, and then Pippen was recovering from the foot surgery. Yeah. Okay, that's it, 98. So, I mean, that's over a quarter century ago, and it was insane. Caleb Williams could be a darn good quarterback. He could be a Hall of Fame quarterback. Um, you know, there are a lot of Hall of Fame quarterbacks out there. You know, Aaron Rodgers is still playing. There's, there's tons of, you know... Um, the Manning brothers are still around. They're on TV and all that. But nobody has that kind of, I, I don't know if you'd call it mystery, um, just a uh, the highlights of what Michael Jordan did on the court still look like one of the greatest acrobats, uh, ballet dancers that you've ever seen. And people go back, a lot of things didn't look, don't look all that good nowadays. If they were done years and years ago, they look kind of old fashioned. Look at Bob Cousy or Oscar Robertson. They had to dribble the ball with their hand on top of the ball or else it was carrying. Everybody now literally carries the ball and throws it down, catches it, throws it down. It's a circle. And that was automatic palming, uh, carrying the ball, traveling, whatever you want to call it, there'd be a violation. So they look mechanical. Jordan did things back when the rules were a bit different and the three-pointer was not that big a deal for whatever reason, nobody figured out. It's uh, well, it's 50% more than a two-pointer. So maybe we should take that. <laughs> Beth Curry. Uh, at any rate, he was doing things that look so modern. Right now, when you see them, it's still unbelievable. How many times have we seen that where he goes up with one hand for the layup, switches to the other under the basket? Or when he would just be so focused on destroying somebody. Somebody maybe is not even worthy of it. Some player who had embarrassed, he felt he'd been embarrassed by. Um, and, and then also his inaccessibility now. We know about him. We see images of him, but he is not out there in the public. He's not a public figure. He, um, you know, all we ever hear about is Michael smoking a cigar, playing golf somewhere, you know? So Caleb yeah. Williams has a lot to live up to if he's going to try to be Michael Jordan. Believe me. Yeah. And also when we're talking about the NBA rules too, as well, they now have the gather. You're allowed to now gather, which is an extra I, I step no and a half, Rick. <laughs> what is that? What is gathering? I, I explain know. that one to me. I've slowed, I, I will watch a game and I will pause it, go back and run it slow motion multiple times. And I'll count one, two, three, four, five and a half steps. And I'm like, I don't know. He's gathered. Is that the Euro step? Is that the, uh, <laughs> the Afro step? The China step? I mean, I have no idea what the palming, traveling, shuffling your feet. You'll see a guy's pivot foot, just shuffle two feet. And uh, guys do these little bitty baby steps that is, like 14 times they traveled. One time, uh, LeBron James picks up the ball and just walks up the court about, he's holding it, takes like three steps. It doesn't even attempt to dribble. And the guy guarding him points to the ref and says, what the hell's going on? And the ref says, eh, just let it go. So yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's un un unbelievable. Gather plus continuation equals and one. Yeah, look, I I'm so glad that you said that when, when you talk about Michael Jordan and we try and everyone wants to make that sort of comparison because it's the it's the top shelf easy one to make. But look, yeah, Caleb Williams, he'd have to do a Gatorade commercial, you know, uh, have a shoe named after him, be in a movie with Bugs Bunny. I mean, there's just so many things that I think is unfair expectation. So, Rick, when we talk about uh, the chosen one, especially in Chicago sports, as a as a sports writer, as a storyteller, what what fascinates you more when these these phenoms come around? Is it the physical ability? Um, you know, I mean, was it the big calves of Mark Pryor, or is it more maybe some of the story of how this fan base is reacting to the supposed chosen one that's going to perhaps save them from the depths and despair of the losses that they've accrued over the years? You know, which side probably fascinates you more? Maybe the physical, or maybe the fan side, the mental side. Well, they're both tied in, and uh, I think you can be mesmerized by the physical capabilities of these athletes. The things they can do are, you know, no normal human can. 
But as you said it very well, fans believe so much in the power of of this display, of this game, and someone who can do it at such marvelous high qualities at such a high uh, level that it's almost mystical. And that helps them. It's funny. I mean, it's it probably isn't completely healthy, but that's the role of sports. It's not important. I mean, in a simple sense, it's not curing any disease. It's not, you know, solving any war, but it can help calm down things. It can help people in ways. I mean, it really is um, an abstraction that I've, I've tried to, uh, you know, wrap my brain around my whole career. Why do we care so much? And it's somehow we... Uh, project ourselves with that person. We don't. We don't identify with the losers. We just don't. The history is written by winners. It has to be. And you think about it. Try to think of history of the world written by the losers, the ones who lost this battle. If, imagine history written by American Indians. It would be the saddest, most pitiful thing ever. No, we write about the white conquerors that came in, the imperialists. We write about uh, you know the Mongol horde, whatever it is. We don't know who finished second in the Super Bowl. I, I couldn't even tell you who was who finished second, you know, like go back five, 10 years. No idea. But the winners, yes. And um, somehow that helps us. We know with like sick little kids, the Make-A-Wish Foundation, so often their desire is to meet one of their heroes. And I think it's built into humans to have this, um, uh, this mythological element within them that we're all living in this mythological world and the hero is the uh, throughout history throughout literature whether it's ulysses whether it's paul bunyan whether it's somebody who has superhuman strength or can do something that makes us feel as you said our despairing little world is bigger than it is and i yeah. I, I don't discount that you know when a team wins i mean it's been proven psychologically when your team wins the super bowl you feel better you're more optimistic. Uh, you're, it's better when you come to work. You work better for your boss. All these things are real. So that fascinates me. And of course, the other thing that fascinates me about sports and about athletes is all of these guys or women, when you get to know them or you get around them, they're just humans. Believe me, they are not superhumans. They may have some characteristic or trait. You know, Noah Lyles can run so fast. I mean, he, so, I mean, that doesn't make him... Running a car can run, you know, ten times faster than him. It can go two hundred miles an hour, three hundred miles an hour. So, great. What are you going to do with that running? Nothing except in that event, the hundred meter dash that everybody watches and everybody cares about. So, it's a really complex thing, and uh, it's endlessly fascinating to me, even after all these years. Yeah, no, I, I I love that you said the the idea too of the mystery of it, right? Because I when I think of the chosen ones, I, you know, for one of them the examples was Kerry Wood. So when Kerry Wood was called up in '98, it was basically a human being can do what? This kid can throw this hard, this yeah. fast. I gotta see it, and maybe in in turn in transaction, then I get some sort of bomb for my cubby to spare through it, and maybe we'll win some games in there. And I think maybe you're you're, you're knocking on something that maybe uh, a lot of people listening right now can take to heart is that, is it fair to say that um, learning how to overcome losing is a skill? You know, it's an acquired skill. It's not necessarily in our nature to um, take losing easily. You know, yeah. when, when a team loses, the, the house is quiet. Everyone is silent. When the team wins, let's pop the champagne, right? I mean, it's a skill yeah. to maybe be acquired. Yeah, and also remember everybody except the chosen few lose everybody all the way to the Super Bowl second best team ends up losing the season. I was talking with a boxing manager one time and um, he was telling me he had a bunch of world champions and he said not one of them had ever retired as champion. That means they lost their last bout or got knocked out or whatever. So um, you're always brought back to earth that way. And I don't think that we know how to lose. I, I always tell kids, um, you know, the best thing about sports is winning. The second best thing is losing because it meant mm. you got to compete and you try as hard as you can, but you let it go and learning how to let losing go because we all lose in life. Believe me, <laughs> you know, nobody's a, a winner for everything and especially all the things that matter. So how do you deal with losing? Winning is easy. You're happy, you're joyful, you run around. Um, but I tell you another thing that I hear from a lot of athletes, and and I've even you know limited amount of things I've done, even if it's just in grade school or high school, you win, and shortly after winning something, a championship, there's this letdown. Like, 
what now? Or what what mm. did that mean? Who am I? And you'll hear it a lot from the athletes. They're just lost. You, you win a gold medal in the Olympics and you've trained your whole life for that and you got it. And then there's this hollowness. And I think Michael Phelps spoke about it. I mean, he was he was messed up. Dude, nobody's won more medals than him. I don't think unless it's uh, Simone Biles finally did. I don't can't keep track of that. But he had put his life as a human being on hold to be this champion. And then it was like, now who am I? What am I? What have I, was that worth it? And uh, you'll see that a lot with athletes. It's something, because being an athlete means it's going to be over someday. You could be a television, or, you know, movie star, maybe keep acting till you're 90. You can be a writer. And if you keep your marbles, you can write till you, you know, you're in your grave, but an athlete it's done at the prime of your life, the early part of your life, it's over. Now, what do I become? What do I do with that? And there's nothing sadder than an athlete, you know, like glory days. Oh man, you know, I, I won this, I won that. Or you go into somebody's house and it's all these trophies. And it's like, okay, that's great. What does that mean to me? Nothing. Now what? That was in the past. And it's the thing is, it's instantly in the past. The moment you win, it's over. If champagne comes out and a party that night and the next day, it may be a parade, but it's over. And it's like, uh, okay, I don't, you know, the first question I'll ask a coach or a star player, you're going to win next year. So it's a never ending thing like that, man. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of uh, mind games going on in all of this. And I, th I guess that's the part of sports that fascinates me. Yeah. That's such an interesting point too, as well, where we, we live in, the, the sports culture and the society of the day after you win a championship, you then have to defend the title. It yeah. immediately turns into a territory. Um, and also, you know, you mentioned a little bit about learning how to deal with losing. And I do say, please, sir, we will get to the White Sox. Uh, hold on. I'm on, on the losing <laughs> side of things. We're here on Sports Talk Chicago and WLS with uh, Rick Tellender. Um, I want to switch over real quick to um, – I think a winning situation personally, and I want to talk about Steve Mongo McMichael. Um, you've wrote, written several articles about him recently. Um, for those that maybe are a little bit of an earlier demographic listening to this show right now, for a defensive tackle, 95 career sacks, nine seasons of seven plus sacks. I mean, those are the, not the type of numbers that you're going to see because the defensive ends are typically the ones getting after the quarterback. Um, I'm going to open this one up to you of whatever is on your mind when you think of Steve Mongo McMichael finally making the Hall of Fame after all these years. Well, first of all, I'm glad he did. It meant yeah. a lot, to him, uh, a whole lot. And for people who don't know, he has, I, I can't even pronounce it, A, whatever, more, uh, ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, uh, lateral sclerosis, the first part, a, I, I can't even remember it. But anyway, it is a horrible neurodegenerative wasting disease but once you get it, you slowly lose the ability to move your muscles. And yet your brain can be intact, your thought process. And that occurred to him about seven years ago. And he slowly devolved into this person. I've seen him, I guess, three times. And the first time I saw him, he was in bed. He couldn't move, but he could still whisper. He's now a person who's in bed, can't move anything, can't move his uh, head, can't move his mouth. All he can do is blink his eyes. So it's one of the most tragic um, uh, diseases you can get. I mean, it's just horrible. So along with that came this campaign to get him in the Hall of Fame, you know, before he dies. This will kill him. It, it kills everybody. It's a fatal disease. We do not have the cure for it. I wish we did. I hope to God they keep working on it. Stephen Hawking, the famous physicist, had it. And he defied all odds by living something like, uh, 45, 50 years with it. Usually it kills you way before that. Steve McMichael, Mongo's had it for seven years. And, um, you know, Misty, his wife, Misty McMichael, who really helped get this thing going, uh, the Hall of Fame, uh, you know, kind of uh, just to get all the voters to consider this and look at his statistics, along with Dan Pompey of The Athletic, he was really mm -hmm. instrumental in this. He's a voter. Dan's a great guy. I saw him when I was down there uh, at uh, in Homer Glen for the ceremony that they had, um, ESPN came in with their cameras and all that to film a lot of bears around McMichael in his bed and uh, for the ceremony. So anyway, those between Pompeii and Misty, they are the ones that got him in. And she tells me, she has told me all the time that Steve, even with his just being able to blink, 
yes or no. That's all he can do. He has a computer, but he has can't quite use it. Hasn't it's too hard. That's supposed to follow your eye movements. Uh, she says he wants to live, and you know a lot of us felt okay. He'll get in the Hall of Fame, and then he can just call it a day. Yeah. Um, but he has a spirit. You know, the guy, he was nuts. He's from Texas. He was hilarious. I I loved him. I was always a little afraid of him. You never knew what he was going to do. He might just grab you and turn you upside down, put you in a garbage can or something. But he also would say the most outrageous things on radio and TV. I mean, he pulled out a big, long hunting knife uh, when he's on uh, Channel 5, I think it was, with Mark Gian Greco. Yeah. Yes, he did. You know, it's like... What's he going to do with this? He didn't know if he's going to chop off Gian Greco's head. And he's got that sly grin all the time. Like, you just don't know. He used to uh, hunt rattlesnakes, you know, just crazy stuff. But he was a great player on that Bears defensive team that won the Super Bowl. The problem for him was too many of those players, they deserve to be in the Hall of Fame, but there's too many uh, almost for a team that only won one Super Bowl. I mean, um mm. There's a, a Jay Hilgenberg, the center, should be in the Hall of Fame, but you can't just keep taking them. They've already got Richard Dent, uh, they've got Mike Singletary, they've got um, Dan Hampton, um, Peyton, uh, Peyton, obviously, on the offensive Peyton, side of the ball. Yeah. Gitka, uh, there's probably somebody I'm missing, but um, yeah, uh, oh, Jim Covert. So that's the only thing that kept Mongo out. So I'm happy he's in. Uh, it's I tell you, it's tough seeing him. It's got to be a lot tougher to be him. But man, what spirit. Uh, unbelievable. Um, it is one of the more, for me, it is, there's a tragedy. There's a tragic element to it because to, to our previous conversation, you know, these athletes, they play, these are the peak human beings that we cheer and that we root for. And then you do get to that age of only 35 and then you have to stop playing the yeah. game that you love and being afflicted with this type of disease um, from someone with this type of personality is tragic. But I, I, I am, I am inspired to hear that Steve McMong, Steve Mongo McMichael would want to live, right? Yeah, like yeah. he would want to see every single day through and be with Misty and see, and, and the best part about it too, Rick, is that there's so many colleagues, not just Dan Pompey and you and other, other scribes, but yeah, all of his former teammates are still really close with him too, as well. So that's really inspiring. Rick, my question for you is, in the advent of social media, that probably would have been something that would have helped his case, perhaps, if he had played in the generation of social media with the eyeballs and the popularity, know that maybe would have gotten him into the Hall of Fame earlier. Is that fair to ask? I'd say it's completely fair. Uh, on the other hand, if he'd played in the era of social media, if most of those bears on that 85 team had, they'd all be in jail. So... They are they they were insane, <laughs> and there was nobody filming it. Thank God for that. But you can hear the stories from them to this day. They'll make you blush and run out of the room, and you just say, "Oh my God, you really that really happened? You guys really did this?" And they did do those things. So he benefited from no social media. Just, <laughs> I mean, oh my God. I mean, you. It, it's, it's crazy. If there'd been somebody filming them where they're like in Platteville and, you know, Ditka would just let them basically, if you show up for practice and you're not too hungover and you can play and you play hard, then do whatever else you want. And, um, oh my God, those little bars and those little towns. And then they were in Valparaiso. Uh, the bears were like, um, yeah, they were like the Beatles times 10 or no, they're more like a, 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 a Viking invasion, a mountain <laughs> horde. You know, <laughs> I was, I was going to say like the Beatles mixed with like a Guns N' Roses or something with the wrong yeah, hotel room Beatles, or something. Or a motorcycle gang, maybe, <laughs> you know, you know, John Lennon's on a Harley. I, I really it's hard to it's hard to even. And don't forget, they had guys like the fridge. I, I know he was up to about 330 pounds. They would try to get him around 310, but he might have been 350 by the end. Anyway, Ditka has him run, pass and uh, catch a ball for touchdown. Now, I don't know if he passed for the touchdown, but he attempted it. But also, they had him carry the ball. And like I said, it was like this entertaining, fun, jolly thing. Except if you're a guy like George Cumby, and I'll never forget him, linebacker for the Packers, weighed probably 225. You know, kind of a normal-sized linebacker for the day. And the fridge annihilated him. He had carried the ball, and Cumby just disappears. It's like... 
oh my god you know it was literally like somebody had to stand in front of a truck and just get run over for you know as part of their you know their pay poor guy i don't think i don't know if he ever recovered from that so that was the bears back then that was um they're lucky oh my god are they lucky there wasn't social media that's all i can say we didn't even bring up the punky qb oh god (laughs) you know what i mean i i think sometimes um when we talk about eras or I specifically when we're talking about teams, sometimes the, the tall tales and the word of mouth um, is, is, is a better story than sometimes uh, when we get every single little piece, every granular piece, maybe on video, if you will. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And I remember when the bears went to London, it was either 19, it was probably 86 after the Super Bowl. I think it was 86, not 87. And it took London by storm and they were doing, I mean, like Willie Galt, here's another guy. He was like, he was like very elegant and he's always got some deal going. And then he had Matt Suey, who's going and talking to the financial guys in London because he's like a stockbroker. He had a fridge posing with Ed Two Tall Jones at Buckingham Palace. Those guys who wear the big hats, you know, and they're standing on either side of the guy. The guy that doesn't move is motionless. Um, I remember they had T-shirts and it showed, instead of showing Walter Payton running the ball, it showed... Uh, the fridge carrying the ball and because people in England didn't know what anything about football, really, they didn't care that much. And here came these guys. uh, And then they saw McMahon and though in Hampton and of course, Mongo doing all this crazy stuff in London. There are all these, um, you know, it was really in the eighties is still very punk scene, you know, people with spiked hairdos and stuff. So they fit in perfectly with all these lunatics and um, nowadays, you know, the coach, you know, it, there'd be photos everywhere, there'd be videos everywhere. So they'd just stay in their hotel rooms, you know. Yeah. They, those players nowadays should only wish that they had the freedom the 85 Bears did. Yeah, it almost sounds like the 85 Bears created the team curfew, possibly. Um, <laughs> and, and, and look, this is, is just reinforcing our opening topic when we talk about Caleb Williams or the chosen one conversation and the expectations of what this Bears team moving forward can be is, look, I I think we have to treat each thing on its own, its own test case. We can't say that it could be as big as Michael Jordan. This team can be as good as the 85 Bears because it's just not fair. And sometimes you just need to appreciate some of the heights that these other teams have had in the zeitgeist of their moment and let Caleb Williams have his time and let the kid grow up. And I don't know, I, I talk I talk about Caleb Williams like I'm protecting a, a nine-year-old kid on his bike for the first time, Rick, because um, <laughs> I, I just I just know how Bears fans get a little bit and, and I, I wanna see it play out and I wanna enjoy the journey and not immediately ask for the result. Maybe something that the parlance of our times um, emphasizes a little too much these days. Yeah, that's a good point. And I think Caleb Williams has a personality, my general opinion that could handle this. He's very mm-hmm. unusual in that regard. He smiles a lot. I hope he keeps smiling. I hope he can keep joking. Doesn't get it turned against him um, because it's very difficult. You lose, start losing games. They lose two games to the Packers this year. It'll, it won't be funny, you know? And that's the thing, the pressure that's on these guys year round prevents them from, uh, you know, really relaxing, I, I think. And so I hope he can handle that, find moments where he can let it all out relax, be himself, and take a deep breath because it's overwhelming the pressure on a quarterback in Chicago. There's only one, you know, and it's yep. one per year. And we keep, we've been trying to get one ever since, uh, you know, thought, maybe thought Jay Cutler was a guy, but it didn't work. And so it's, you have to go all the way back to Jim McMahon, who's constantly injured. And then you got to go back to, you know, I don't know, the 40s or something, Sid Luckman, Chicago's looking for that great, great Hall of Fame quarterback. And if it is him, well, boy, welcome to it, man. If if he turns out to be, uh, well, I mean, we just don't know. He could be great. I, everybody's raving still about the pass he threw to uh, Dunze. You know, it's like they won the Super Bowl. It's like you can watch it on the internet. <laughs> You know, it's like great it's practice, though. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're 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 taking in only what we can. Some of that might have to do with some of the other stuff going on in Chicago sports, which I want to transition to because I want to talk to you about my favorite sport, baseball. Before we get you out of here, a legendary columnist of the Chicago Sun Times, Rick Tellender, here joining Sports Talk Chicago right here on WLS AM eight ninety. Um, I want to start with the White Sox because I want to end on a positive note, talking about Ryan Sandberg. So let's talk a little White Sox just really quick. My question for you 
isn't so much where do the White Sox go from here? Because I, I, I think we a little bit we know a little bit about the rock and the hard place of what the immediate future of the White Sox looks like. But my question for you is working in sports decade after decade, you've talked to a lot of people in different front offices. For Jerry Reinsdorf, when you're when you get reports that Jerry has lobbied for a new stadium, um, when Jerry is taking his stadium channel or his stadium um, business and he's creating the Chicago Sports Channel that's going to be featuring the Blackhawks, Bulls, and White Sox starting this fall, when you see renderings of what he wants to do around the United Center, creating a little bit more of um, a social mecca for Chicagoans to come and enjoy, which I'm on board with, mm-hmm. how much can we – are we actually able to put pressure on a businessman who also just so happens to be a baseball owner? Can we, are we able to put pressure on somebody that has, that is an American that can make his decisions, what he wants to do with his money. Um, We can't force him to put the money back into the team. Um, How do you make sense of all that? And how do you kind of toe that line of the competitive balance of, what he should be paying hopefully for his baseball team with the White Sox versus what he wants to do and other business ventures in his life? Well, the simple answer to, you know, your original question, can we put pressure on him? The answer is no. He, um, you know, it's a cartel, the, the major league baseball, it's the definition of a cartel. There's no other competition. You can't get in. You can, I can't, I got a hundred billion. Elon Musk can't just buy a team. He has yeah. to buy an existing team. Uh, I just saw that Jerry Jones and the Cowboys, the first franchise worth $10 billion. And Jerry Jones has more money than, you know, than he could ever use, ever need. And yet they can't win a Super Bowl. The Cowboys can't either. Uh, They haven't spent money right. They've got bad contracts. But the fans can bitch about it all they want. But you can't really change it. We don't own the White Sox. You know, they are on pace Right now, still to have the worst record in the history of modern baseball, going back to 1900, which is astounding because I remember the 1962 Mets. I was alive then as a kid, and it was like a uh, a team that nobody even knew who they were playing with. You know, it was like, who are you? Hey, hi. They just yeah. put a bunch of players together, called it a team, and Casey Stengel was a manager, said hilarious things like, he has some classic line like, can anybody here play baseball? Um, that's who they're competing with. 40 and 120, the White Sox are headed towards, should embarrass anybody, especially the owner. Should hear rants and raves and just, I can't deal with this. But once you're in that cartel, winning is not all that important um, unless you feel it yourself. So, and you have to have good people, really smart people working it because it's a cartel, even with the talent, the draft. There's nothing like a draft in the real world. If you go to Yale, law school. There's not a draft for you where you have to go to San Francisco to this law firm or Texas to this law firm or some little town in Green Bay, Wisconsin. You go wherever you want. But in in baseball, football, basketball, hockey, a draft to keep things orderly in the cartel means that you go where you're you're forced to go. And the worse your team, the better your pick. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. That's like a horrible restaurant gets the best steaks all next year at a cheap price because you're so bad. Oh, well, that's a good deal. There's incentive to be bad. Rebuilding, or, you know, uh, tanking. That's impossible in the real world. You can't make your business crappy and say, because well, we're going to have really good in a couple of years. No, you just go out of business. But that doesn't happen in Major League Baseball, football, or anything else. So Reinsdorf is in this deal. He's 88 or 89. I mean, I remember when Sam Zell died, you know, the big real estate guy, and you know, whatever your entrepreneur in Chicago, he died. He had seven or $8 billion. And I'm thinking to myself, well, sorry about that. You had $8 billion, but guess what? You're dead. I mean, you can't take it with you. Can't take it with you. I just want to keep reminding Jerry Reinsdorf. You can't, maybe you figure out a way like the, you know, in an Egyptian pyramid and they'll put all your money in there with you and you can, I I don't know. Uh, But it makes no sense. So, Back to the original question about uh, what do you do about a team like the White Sox? It could be something where the league finds you enormously for not performing properly because basically they they demean the whole major leagues. Any team going to play the White Sox, they're saying, oh, my God, we got three wins coming up or two. We're going to win this series, which is a fact. So it's like they're a 
double A team playing against major league teams. They're like a, a clown team, like the the team, the Washington Generals that used to play the Harlem Globetrotters. You know, I think they were one in ten thousand or something. That's <laughs> the Globetrotters. Uh, it is a remarkable thing. I hope they set the record as the worst team ever because it's no good just to be close to it. Might do it, blow it out of the water, just make it right there in front of everybody, and then see what happens. But Jerry Reinsdorf made his money in real estate. And I think what, the way you your business, whatever it is, you can't take that out of yourself. His desire is to develop and 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 real estate. And baseball is like a fun sideline for him. That's all. Yeah, and I, I man, that's a that's a great way of putting it because as it looks as I, I don't want to I don't want to posit like a lot of other people say that Jerry Reinsdorf completely doesn't care because I don't believe that. I think Jerry has always said in in past articles that baseball was his childhood love and and he loves the White Sox. It just feels like that when you have someone who is very rich, who has what we would call the diverse portfolio of being a rich person, it feels like the White Sox are just su on such a low priority on his mm -hmm. list that it just sort of makes it makes the, the light at the end of the tunnel seem miles and miles and miles away. Um, and then when he kind of puts it on the fans and says, well, if the fans came out to the ballpark, then I would spend money. There's actually empirical evidence that when the White Sox at least try and compete, White Sox fans do show up. It's that yeah. when the White Sox fans rebuild and then they give up the white flag trade or what they've tried to do over the last 10 to 12 years, White Sox fans just aren't going to pay good money to, to go out, to go out there and do that. So, um, I think we're both we're both ending a, at a place where there's an impasse on this. So I just wanted to get your opinion on where we were with Jerry. I want to switch over to the Cubs, and this is our final topic. We'll get you out of here on this. Um, the Ryan Sandberg statue was unveiled in June. Um, mm -hmm. Rhino's been through a really tough last year, but as you as many have seen on social media, he's chronicled his battle with cancer, um, mm -hmm. and he's been so strong throughout the process. And, and I I hopefully I can speak among many Chicagoans in supporting him. Um, and rooting for him. I want to open it up like this, and then we'll also talk about the statue. When Sandberg retired, from what I remember, the conversation was, who's the greatest second baseman of all time? And it was Joe Morgan versus Ryan Sandberg. Uh, am I remembering that correctly? And where did you land on that at the time? I, I think you you are remembering it correctly. Now, there's old guys who played you know, second base. Again, Hornsby, yeah. Hornsby was always up there too. Yeah. And consider developments in the glove and things like that. You know, I mean, they used mm. to use something that barely covered their hand. So there were great players throughout history, but Joe Morgan was a very special type of player. He, you know, he wasn't that tall, very athletic, quick. He could do a backflip and all this stuff. Sandberg was a, a longer, more graceful, not, not that Morgan wasn't graceful, but he was more like, uh, again, a ballet. When you see beautiful ballet, you'd see some of Sandberg's moves in the field were so smooth and effortless. It was just beautiful. When he retired, you know, quite often, almost always when a player retires, they're not at their peak, they're on their way down. So you tend to remember that, eh, not that good. But then you go back to the years like, was it 84? Whatever they had, the Sandberg game, um, where he had power, he had he could steal bases, and he was so fluid in the field. It was just, it was beautiful to see. The thing I know, remember most about Ryan Sandberg, and he, he's a terrific guy, but he had a personality that was very, very shy, very reserved. When he talked to him in the locker room, even after he had a great game, he had almost nothing to say. And it was almost like he, he was nervous and embarrassed. And there was something to him that took years and years to kind of relax over. And he's gotten there. He's not there completely. He'll always be that kind of introspective, uh, quiet. Uh, you don't see him out partying. You don't see him out being very demonstrative. He's very internal. Everything he did was about baseball. And, um, you know, he's a manager for the Phillies. Didn't do very well. I'm not sure he's the kind of guy that should lead other people he's the person yeah, was, wasn't that a surprise rick that he wanted to get into managing didn't a lot of people go wait surprise. wait what rhino wants to lead the uh quiet rhino yeah it didn't didn't fit with uh his personality or what we knew of him and i think he may have been one of those guys after baseball what do i do now and mm. so i was just logical to manage and so he said i think he can do it he shouldn't have. he should have gone to the minor leagues or college or something like that uh stayed in baseball in some way but yeah, that didn't work out. So that delayed him, uh, you know, the, the talk about him as a great player. You forget 
once a Elgin Baylor became a you know general manager and people forgot what a great basketball player he was. Larry Bird was, you know, he did okay. When these guys go into management after being a great player, quite often if they go into managing, they're not very good managers. What they had was a natural ability and a natural mindset that they can't transmit to somebody else. They can talk about it all they want, but they can't say, you know, like Hank Aaron can't say, well, you just you just do this with your wrist. It's like, yeah, okay. If I could do it, I'd hit 700 home runs. There's all kinds of things like that that uh, – a great player will have, but I tell you, um, the ceremony, which, you know, became what we're talking about because the uh, statue that they unveiled at Wrigley Field, um, it was a very emotional moment, especially for him. You know, he's, uh, I think he loved it. He gave great talks about it. And when they first pulled the the sheet off it, I was right there and I thought, man, that looks like Pete Rose. <laughs> <laughs> they had the glasses on. They gave him the glasses too, which is interesting. That's a flip up glass. But yeah. look, at, look at the guy. And I told Sandberg, I said, man, you look at your biceps. Yeah, I mean, the guy, the statue is jacked. There's veins. It looks like, you know, whatever. And Ryan was a, a lanky, smooth guy. Anyway, it's him. It's uh, it's quite an honor. And it's there with, you know, the other, the other greats. Well, uh, if you'll allow me this moment, I did a bit of an exercise. Um, because I tried to ask myself the question, yeah, when he retired was, you know, when Ryan Sandberg passed Joe Morgan for the all-time list of co career home runs as a second baseman, back when we cared about home runs, and that was a real thing, Rick, um, I, I, I thought that Sandberg was the greatest second baseman of all time. So I just pulled up some quick numbers here for our audience about some guys that came after him. And I will make a compelling case that Ryan Sandberg still might be the greatest all around second baseman of all time. Now there's certain guys that passed him in home runs like Jeff Kent. He's got 377. He leads them all time. He played 17 years. Uh, he did win an MVP, but zero gold gloves. His war was 55.4. Roberto Alomar, great defensive player, played 17 years, 10 gold gloves, one more than Rhino, 67 war. Robinson Cano came a little bit later. Great hitter, 17 years. Again, 68.1 war. Just above Ryan Sandberg, who, if we remember, the strike happened in 94. He retired for a year, and they gave him a year with Philadelphia where he barely played. So Rhino kind of only played about 14-ish years mm -hmm. in Major League Baseball. Nine gold gloves, one MVP, 282 home runs, but 67.9 war right on pace more than Roberto Alomar, just underneath Robinson Cano, who had three more seasons. So I looked at it and I said, you know, Rhino may be the most complete second baseman of all time. But nobody's, well, they can argue with you. You can argue about anything. Oh, sure. <laughs> I, I, you're completely correct. I mean, yeah. it, and, and, you know, he started out his career with like 0 for 21 or something like that. If people, the Cubs fans need to know, you're right, he started in Philly. And they, uh, you know, that's another bad thing Philly did trading him, but or however he came to the Cubs. But yeah, he uh, he lost a year. Um, and you know, when I vote for the Hall of Fame, and I do, you could you really don't need humans to vote anymore with all the statistics, you know, from war to whip to war plus, and you know, you can you can basically create who that player was from statistics. I do it a different way. I, I look at all the all-star games they played in. I look at their gold gloves, their batting average, home runs, you know, for pitchers, it's strikeouts, innings, pitch, wins, losses, saves, holds, all that stuff. But I look at it when I watch somebody play, you know, I think I was watching a Hall of Famer. And mm -hmm. that is an internal thing that you can't debate with me because I felt that way. You can say, well, you shouldn't have. Well, maybe I shouldn't have, but I did. And there were players like that when I saw them. I mean, you saw Pete Rose. And it's just like, no, this guy should be a Hall of Famer. Ernie Banks, Billy Williams, um, Willie Stargell. I just remember these guys. Bob Gibson. I mean, I don't need to see any stats from about Bob Gibson. Uh, so that's, to me, the human element still deciding the Hall of Fame. But if we just go to all the statistics and all the stats geeks can argue this guy should be in and this guy shouldn't, i am like, okay, well, then what do you need my opinion for? You don't. Just... <laughs> Bunch of numbers. You're in the Hall of Fame. Ding, ding, ding. The, the, you know, Hal, the computer says you're a Hall of Famer. Okay, great. Then you get a punch out card. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, that's so funny. Uh, before, uh, so speaking of the Cubs, before we get out of here, uh, Rick, you have another book coming out 
Um, yeah. Your upcoming book is called The Magic Ball, co-written by former uh, Cubs Steve Trout. Can you just tell us a little bit about yeah. it, um, what it's about, and how you got connected with Steve to, to put together The Magic Ball? It's wild. Steve Trout is, he's nuts in a lovable way. I think everybody remembers him pitching. He and his dad, Dizzy Trout, had the second most wins by a father-son combination in Major League Baseball. Astounding. And Trout had some really good years. Uh, anyway, I've known him through the years, and he's hes always doing different things. He's inventing things. He's invented a pillow that you use uh, when you're on an airplane. He invented these uh, plastic things for strike zones. He invented... Um, always coming up with stuff. And he came to me with this idea, this he had written a good part of it called the magic ball about a ball. Well, it's a secret, but it's really cool. This ball comes into his kid's life in a certain way and it helps him and it can talk, shocks the hell out of this kid. And it ends up helping other kids when you find out where it came from and how it can do this. It's really fascinating. And it's, it's probably only uh, 60, 58 pages long. It's for boys or girls aged 8 to 12. Oh, and it's great. got a beautiful, beautiful cover that done by an artist, Chicago artist named Mark McMahon. And there's a tornado and there's a ball in the middle of it. And I'm telling you, it's really cool. So Trout needed help with this. I started editing it and doing this and that. And then we wrote it together. And... Um, I would like to do a series of them, other magic balls. But I, I, if you check it out, it's pretty cool. I got to tell you, we had we tried it out on one nine-year-old kid, a travel team pitcher uh, for a team in Skokie, and he stayed up almost all night reading it. And so we put his quote on the back. I, <laughs> it's it said, what's his name? Uh, uh, what's his name? Something uh, Fanning, nine, nine and under pitcher, Coyotes team. Skokie, Illinois. I love this book. I read, you know, anyway, that's our endorsement. Yeah. And the other one on the cover from Bob Costas, who loved it. Oh, you know, that's, yeah. that's wonderful. Um, Bob, Bob is so amazing. And yeah, I mean, that that's right up my alley too. Growing up, I was a scholastic kid. It would come in, you would get all the things and I, I would just, yeah. I would just take in books about Jerry Rice or Michael Jordan or anything that I can get my hands on. So, and that's such a formative age too, as well. Um, good for you. That's so great. Uh, and hopefully, uh, if anyone's listening right now, the magic ball, when does it come out or is it already out, Rick? It's, out, it's, it's actually, we did it on, um, it's online. You just go to Amazon. Oh, perfect. It's, it's kind of, uh, I, we haven't had the official publication date yet, but I think you can order now. You, I'm pretty sure you can. It's all set. It looks, it's beautiful. And uh, you can't not, even an adult, you got to read it. You have to say, what? Wait a minute. And so it's, and this took Trout. He's a, you know, he's a lefty. What else do you need to say? He's a left-handed pitcher. <laughs> he's got a so screw I channeled, loose. <laughs> yeah, I, I corralled his brain. And then, you know, as a writer, I, anyway, so I, it's a good combo, I think. A really good combo, him and me. We got more to go. Enjoying it. The Magic Ball, uh, written by Rick Tellender and also former Cub Steve Trout. You can check that out online. Speaking of online, I'm sure you could check out Rick's uh, TikToks or podcasts or whatever he's doing these days. The man yeah. lives for the internet. Uh, no, I'm, I'm <laughs> doing an interview yeah. right now. He's in a beautiful house right now in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Um, I'm very jealous. Good on you. Thank you so much for joining Sports Talk Chicago here on WLS, uh, Rick. Um, I really value the time. I really appreciate it. And it's such a treat for me. Thank you so much. Thank you, Joey. I appreciate it, too. Really do.